live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. One of the most frustrating things as a fan is when your team has a glaring need and does absolutely nothing to address it, even though everyone knew that it was going to be a problem going into the season. If you need a tight end and you don't sign one in free agency or draft one, and then sure enough your tight end situation is insanely poor during the season, what did you think was going to happen? We've seen plenty of teams do this and have it backfire on them, but I'm not sure there's a team that did it worse than the New York Jets during the 1995 season. Consider this. The Jets had a glaring need at wide receiver. They needed a veteran presence on the team because their unit was just that depleted. The head coach himself even commented that the team needed a veteran wide receiver, and he was also the de facto general manager, so he had complete power to make a move. There was a free agent veteran wide receiver on the market who was a really good player and who openly expressed interest in joining the Jets. For some reason, the Jets decided not to sign him and to not do anything. And sure enough, the Jets go on to have a laughably bad receiving unit that does next to nothing to the surprise of absolutely no one with half a brain. If you want to see some amazing ineptitude, you've come to the right place. This is the story of the 1995 New York Jets and what might be the most puzzling move of Rich Kodite's entire career. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to understand who the receiver was, how bad the Jets were at the position, and why this seemed like a match made in heaven that never materialized. Our story begins all the way back in 1986, when in the second round of the NFL Draft, the Cleveland Browns drafted a wide receiver out of San Diego State named Webster Slaughter. Cleveland was seriously depleted at the receiver position. Outside of Ozzie Newsom, who was a tight end, no player on the team had 500 receiving guards. The Browns were hoping that he could bolster a passing attack that desperately needed some help. And sure enough, Slaughter turned out to be an incredible pick, as he became one of the better receivers in football. In his six seasons with the Browns, he had 305 receptions for 4,834 yards and 27 touchdowns. He finished inside the top 10 in the league in receiving touchdowns during the 1987 season, and in 1989, was 7th in receiving yards and was named the second team All-Pro, thanks in part to a 97-yard touchdown catch he had against the Chicago Bears. By the end of the 1991 season, Slaughter had established himself as one of the best receivers in the history of the franchise as he was one of just two players, alongside Max Speedy, to have at least 300 career receptions and over 55 receiving yards per game. However, after a nasty contract dispute, he became a free agent and joined the Houston Oilers in 1992. Slaughter played three seasons with the Oilers and was an incredibly productive player there as well, picking up right where he left off. He made the Pro Bowl in 1993 after recording a career-high 77 receptions and was definitely one of Warren Moon's go-to targets. In Slaughter's three seasons down in Houston, he had 184 receptions for 2,236 yards, meaning that at this point in his career, Slaughter had over 7,000 receiving yards. By the end of 1994, he was just outside the top 50 all-time in this category. Obviously, as Slaughter was entering his 30s, he did not have a Hall of Fame career or anything close to resembling one, but he was a highly dependable receiver for close to a decade, and put up fairly consistent numbers across the board. The Oilers cut him in the summer of 1995 in a money-saving move since Bud Adams was notoriously cutting back on expenses in what would become the final days of the Houston Oilers. And now, Slaughter was a free agent looking for a new home. He had shown no signs of declining whatsoever. He had 68 receptions for 846 yards during that 1994 campaign. And if there was any team that should have been interested in his services at this point, it was the New York Jets. In 1994, the New York Jets receiving corps was perfectly serviceable. By no means was it good, and you could definitely do better, but you could do a heck of a lot worse. There was virtually no depth to speak of, but they had a fairly solid one-two punch in the starting lineup. Leading the way was Rob Moore, the team's first-round pick in the 1990 NFL Supplemental Draft. I talked about an unbelievable game he had during that 1994 season against the Denver Broncos in a previous video of mine, which might have been the best game of his career. If you want to learn more about that, then click the card in the upper right corner. He finished that 1994 season as one of the best receivers in the game boasting 78 receptions for 1,010 yards and 6 touchdowns, all of which were career highs at the time, and he made it to the first Pro Bowl of his career. And they had Art Monk, who even at 37 years old, well out of his prime, was still a fine receiver, boasting 46 receptions for 581 yards and catching over 70% of the passes thrown his way. Again, a receiving unit led by Moore and Monk wasn't great, but it was by no means bad. However, that unit becomes bad when you remove both Moore and Monk from the equation. The Jets released Monk early in the offseason, and he would finish his career with the Philadelphia Eagles later that season. As for Rob Moore, he was a free agent. And even though the Jets wanted to bring him back, even to the point where they kept wide receivers coach Richard Mann primarily because he had a good relationship with Moore, they wound up trading him one day before the draft to the Arizona Cardinals. Note that Moore had to be signed as a Jet before he could become a member of the Cardinals. So if you're confused, 
The long story short is that neither starting receiver that the Jets had in 1994 was with the team in 1995. This meant that the receivers that the Jets had right now were absolutely atrocious. The wide receiving unit was completely decimated. I want to give some perspective on just how depleted this unit was. In a 1980 game against the San Francisco 49ers, running back Clark Gaines caught 17 passes. As a side note, if you want to learn more about Gaines and his bizarre career with the Jets, then click the card in the upper right corner. His 17 receptions in that game were more than every single receiver on the Jets had combined in 1994. Seriously. The three receivers that the team had left over were Stevie Anderson, who had nine catches, Ryan Yarbrough, who had six, and Orlando Parker, who had one. It was an incredibly young unit, with Anderson being 25 years old, Yarbrough being 24, and Parker being 23. They needed a veteran. Rich Kodite knew that they needed a veteran. And sure enough, there was a very good veteran on the market that inexplicably, the Jets decided to ignore. Kodite recognized right away that the Jets had a massive problem at the position. Again, considering the fact that he was a general manager as well and had complete control over the roster, I don't know why he seems so surprised by this when he just got rid of the two starters from last year. But he wanted someone to step up, and that just did not happen. Training camp in 1995 was marred by receivers dropping passes, not getting separation, and running the wrong routes. It was a young, inexperienced group that wasn't very good, and Kodak said as much, saying we've got a lot of young people who have talent but haven't had the repetitions. I want someone to step forward. Realizing this, and after openly expressing that his team needed a veteran receiver, Kodai decided to fly Webster Slaughter in for a workout. Slaughter seemed like the perfect fit. He checked every box possible. Veteran receiver? Check. He had played nine seasons in the league by this point. Productive player? Check. He had crossed the 800-yard mark in five of the past six seasons, including the two most recent ones. A player who got separation, didn't drop passes, and didn't run the wrong routes? Check. A player who was interested in playing for the Jets? Check. All checks across the board. Which is why immediately after scheduling the workout, Rich Kodai and the Jets promptly canceled it. Yes, despite checking every box and despite meeting all the criteria that Kodai was desperately looking for, Kodai for some reason decided not to work out Slaughter. It had nothing to do with an injury history or something controversial or a change in heart on Slaughter's part. Instead, it was because Slaughter was looking for $1.7 million. Yes, it was a bit on the expensive side, as it would have made him the 8th highest paid receiver in football, but it was by no means extreme or egregious, especially we consider that Alvin Harper was getting roughly three times that amount, and Slaughter had better numbers than he did. Plus, the money didn't matter. The Jets had over $3.8 million in cap room, which was a fair amount back then, and it was the end of July, so it's not like the Jets were going to need that money on big free agent signings. The Jets scheduled and then canceled a workout for Slaughter over a few bucks in the grand scheme of things, and over a few bucks that did not matter, even though Kodai openly expressed his desire for a player like Slaughter. And I think you can imagine how poorly this is going to play out for New York. Let's cut straight to the chase. The Jets were atrocious in 1995, going 3-13. There's a reason Adam Gase isn't considered by a lot of Jets fans to be the worst head coach in franchise history, and that's because Rich Kodai, in all his ineptitude, exists. In 1995, the Jets scored 233 points, or an average of 14.6 points per game. Not only was that the worst total in football, but it's even worse when you consider the fact that there were two expansion teams that year. And unsurprisingly, the passing game was a train wreck. Whether it was Boomer Esiason or Rubby Brister or Glenn Foley under center, no one could get anything going with the cast of characters that the team had, as the Jets threw more interceptions than touchdowns. And when I say the Jets were atrocious in the passing game, I truly mean it. Every team in the NFL averaged at least 5 yards per pass attempt. That is, every team except for the Jets who averaged 4.4, which was last by more than half a yard. The team finished 28th in passing yards and 28th in interceptions thrown, which is not ideal. Outside of undrafted rookie Wayne Corbett, not a single player on the team had 500 receiving yards. The three guys that Kodai had as his starting receivers going into the season, they all did nothing. Stevie Anderson played for the Cardinals. Ryan Yarbrough had 18 receptions for 230 yards and two touchdowns. Orlando Parker didn't play a single game after the 1994 season. They really could have used a veteran receiver, because it might have saved them from having the first pick in the draft. Speaking of veteran receivers, how did Webster Slaughter perform in 1995? Did the Jets dodge a bullet by not giving him what he wanted? No, they did not. They just looked really stupid. Slaughter was signed a few weeks after the aborted workout by the Kansas City Chiefs, and even though he wasn't the full-time starter, he had a fairly solid season, posting 34 receptions for 514 yards. For some perspective, he averaged 15.1 yards per catch that season. That would have not only led the Jets, but would have led the team by more than two full yards. 
was not signing Webster Slaughter the only reason the Jets were 3-13 in 1995 and were putrid with their passing attack? Absolutely not. However, would having a veteran presence like Slaughter have helped? And would the Jets have had a better passing attack because of him? Absolutely. And I think Kodak recognized his mistake a year too late. In 1996, the Jets decided that they needed to bolster their receiving core and bolster it badly. They spent their first two draft picks on receivers, taking USC wide receiver Keyshawn Johnson with the first overall pick and Nevada wide receiver Alex Van Dyke with their second round pick. And sure enough, later in the offseason, figuring that they needed a veteran presence at the position and figuring that they needed some sort of experienced player considering how awful the previous season went, they signed none other than Webster Slaughter. It was one year too late, but the Jets finally got their guy. Kodite had nothing but praise for Slaughter, calling him a guy who had played in big games, has sure hands, and is a go-to guy. However, in 1996, Slaughter had the worst year of his career by just about every metric possible. He caught just 32 passes, which was the worst total of his career. He had just 434 yards receiving, which was the worst total of his career. And he had just two receiving touchdowns, which was the worst total of his career. Slaughter didn't get too many opportunities to see the field regularly, thanks to Johnson and Quebec getting the bulk of the targets. And while Slaughter was a serviceable rotational option, by no means was he what he was in the prime of his career, or even one year prior in 1995. After missing 1997, Slaughter played one more year in 1998 with the San Diego Chargers, but didn't do much of anything there and ended his career after that season. But even though the Jets eventually got Slaughter in 1996, the fact that they didn't get him in 1995 is laughable, and it ended with predictable results. They needed a good experienced veteran receiver, and the coach said as much. Slaughter checked every box and wanted to play for the team. And because Kodak didn't want to spend a few extra bucks that the Jets weren't even going to use in the first place, it never materialized and it resulted in the Jets having the worst passing attack and the worst receiving unit in football. Instead of having Webster Slaughter, in 1995, thanks to the ineptitude of Rich Kodite, the Jets' offense was the one who was getting slaughtered. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jarrogator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who help get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.